FromSoft was cracked at the turn of the millennium. From a late PlayStation going throughout PS2, their output was insane, and I think what best exemplifies that are the PS2 launch titles. So get this, FromSoft released three games at launch. Fucking three. Armored Core 2, Eternal Ring, and Evergrace. Shit's wild. But more than that, let's take a look at what released in the years of, prior, and post-release of Evergrace and Forever Kingdom. In 1999, you've got Armored Core Master of Arena, Spriggan Luniverse, Frame Gride, and Echo Knight 2. In 2000, the year the PS2 launched, came their three launch titles as well as Adventures of Cookie and Cream. 2001 had Armored Core 2 and Other Age, Forever Kingdom, and Kingsfield 4. And finally, 2002 with Armored Core 3, Lost Kingdoms, Murakumo Renegade Mech Pursuit, and Atogi Myth of Demons. Over this four year span, FromSoft released 15 games. 15 fucking games. That's an insane level of production that's just no longer seen in this era, so it's nuts to think about. The production cycle for games in this era were a lot cheaper and quicker than it is now, which not only allowed for way more output, but also way more variety in that output as well. And you look at FromSoft, I mean not just them, but practically every studio nowadays who are no longer able to create unique experiments of games or risk financial adversity, and they've been making mostly Souls-like games since Dark Souls 2. And hey, better make Souls games and suck and dick or worse, pachinko, to keep the lights on, and I got no problem with Souls games either. What I do have a problem with is a lack of weird, experimental, and varied titles. This is why I really like going back into FromSoft's catalog of older games because they made some unique shit with that distinct FromSoft flavor. Specifically, the Evergrace and Forever Kingdom duology. Specifically, the Forever Grace duology. With such a strong aesthetic of a fall sunset looking far off into the reddening sky, as leaves blow by, created such a strong first impression. I haven't even started the game proper, and already I'm loving what the game is throwing at me between the visuals and the unique as hell song accompanying it, with its use of vocal samples inviting me into a game that feels like no other. This is easily one of my favorite title screens I've seen. And when I decide to leave the trance it puts me in and press new game, I was immediately given a choice. Darius or Charlene. You can pick either character and go through their own story, then go through the other character's story. You can also, midway through a story at any point, decide to start up and play the other character's campaign at a save point. I've only ever seen this exact same structure in one other game, Muramasa the Demon Blade. If you're familiar with that game, then you get how this is structured then. In terms of who to pick, a couple of notes. Charlene's campaign is chronologically first and is also the lesser of the two campaigns in my opinion. So, I chose to go with Charlene first, not for those reasons, but because she's got hair so red I can come on it. In the blink of an eye, the world was conquered by the strongest military empire with magical Palmyra armaments. Is that a fucking typo? Huh? In the opening cutscene, Charlene wakes up to a woman named Sienna who brought her back to her house. After Sienna leaves, Charlene eavesdrops on her conversation with super evil asshole Morpheus and... Uh... Run! Hope you didn't need that, Sienna. We learn about some cursed crash shit and Sienna gets kidnapped. And what the fuck is up with Trandon's stupid fucking hair? Mother should be ashamed of how fucking shitty he looks. Kid probably gets bullied at school for that shit. Charlene then gets the motive to find and save Sienna. And this is where we are given control. The best way I can describe my first experience in Evergrace is a state of confused panic. You're thrown into the deep end, given no tutorial, and thrown into this world that wants you dead. Enemies start spawning from out of the ether and is looking to fuck you in the ass. With zero equipment or weapons, getting some of those should be a priority. Luckily, there's a cooking pot right outside Sienna's house. Pick that up and put it on your head? I mean, I guess that works. Kick the shit in as many enemies as you need to earn enough Palmyra bucks to enter the shop and... Greetings. Feel free to look over my merchandise. What the fuck? That elephant man behind the counter is terrifying. I don't like the way he's looking at me. Now to address the elephant in the room. That music. The song playing when you enter the shop can be jarring as hell when you enter. It's chaotic. It feels like a jumbled mess of songs playing over top of each other. But that intro transitions into something way more structured and grounded and it starts sounding a lot nicer. The soundtrack sounds inspired by various cultures as music played through a lens not at all from those cultures but also one who isn't the most trained of musicians which results in an OST with a flair and flavor all on its own. And that was largely the FromSoft sound of the era with Kota Hoshino being the main man on music. A feeling and vibe, completely MIA since the DS days as he hasn't done any composition for FromSoft for nearly a decade. 
instead working on sound effects and the like. The dude went to FromSoft fresh out of being a student resulting in a sound that's a bit unrefined at this point. Not saying that it's amateurish, not at all, but his time at FromSoft is some of his first professional works to the point that you can hear his growth as a composer over the years just by playing FromSoft's games. And that lack of work in a professional world meant that he wasn't mentally bound by the standards and conventions of the music manufacturing world, which led to him being able to go wild and create this unique as fuck music. The tracks rely so heavily on samples. Kota Hoshino sampled his voice a lot throughout this entire soundtrack, which helped lend to the otherworldly folk feel that this game is going for. And because it sounds like these songs are made mostly from samples, it gives a bit of an electronic edge as well. It doesn't feel completely natural, and I'd say that is incredibly fitting for Evergrace. While one of the cheapest things you can get is a frying pan, what is FromSoft implying by immediately giving the girl the cooking gear? I would recommend skipping that and grinding enough money in this starting area for two things. The first being the spear, easily the best weapon you can get that I used as a main weapon for Charlene's entire story. The other thing you should get is the heroic necklace accessory. Buy it, equip it, cherish it, love it, for it loves you. Who doesn't love free regen? That's the good shit right there. Travel to Serimad Hill, trade a flower for the sword star key item from this old man and learn two things in the meanwhile. The first, Rubain is an isolated world. No one gets in or out. Charlene somehow got isekai'd in here. Two, this old man gives no fucks about being impaled. Go back to the Royal Commons because there's a door there now made accessible with the traded item key. Touch the statue and get teleported to the Human Research Lab. The Human Research Lab revolves around a puzzle involving using the right equipment to get through these doors and shut off what's happening in there. The only way to get that equipment is you gotta fight for it and the combat in Evergrace is... serviceable? I wouldn't say it's terrible, but it sure is shit not what you're playing this game for. It's not doing anything special, it's doing what's expected of it. And that's fine. You've got two attacks. One where you hold the stick neutral and one where you tilt the stick as you attack. Neutral attacks tend to be some sort of swing or some shit, but the tilts are the real shit as they tend to be pokes. They've got much longer range and usually faster than their lesser neutral counterparts. So just poke the shit out of everything around you, killing anything from a far range. The weapon that doesn't really follow this rule of neutral and tilt is the bow. More on the bow later. The strength of your attacks is tied to your stamina and your stamina is tied to your health. If you decide to attack with no stamina, you'll do 1 HP's worth of damage to the enemy. If you attack with all your stamina, you'll do a good damage. And Evergrace allows you to vary up how much stamina you want to use by use of the DualShock 2's analog buttons. Did you know the PS2 had analog buttons? Crazy shit. And the options you could change the sensitivity for how hard you want to press for max stamina use, or even outright turn off analog buttons. Which you should do. There's no reason to ever use less than maximum, so throw that shit in the trash. When you're at full health, your stamina will take a little bit longer to regenerate to max than at low health. It's not so much of a difference to really make it super worthwhile to play risky at low health to attack slightly sooner, so just heal. Why risk that shit and die like a dumb bitch? Fight and puzzle your way through the human research lab to get to the underground section. I don't personally find this section of the game too interesting. And at the end of the underground research lab, you fight several doppelgangers of yourself, which is a cool idea. The first time you fight it, then you have to rinse and repeat twice more. What a waste of a foursome. For shame. But at the end of the labs, you finally get to see Sienna again. Hey girl, you doing good? No. No, she isn't. She's under Morpheus's control, which obviously means you gotta murder her. With arrows. You're locked out of using Palmyra here, and you can't really get close enough even with the spear, so naturally that leaves the bow as the way to fight this boss. I'm not the biggest fan of the bow, which, fuck me, I guess, since the bow's required for some of Charlene's bosses and very recommended for others. It takes a long ass time to fire it, leaving you prone to attacks, and if you do get hit, even after you fire the arrow, the arrow just disappears and won't connect. Well, ain't that some shit? Because the game can't figure out a way to transition you to the next area, it just says, fuck it, teleport. The abandoned road is your resident lava section, complete with instant kill terrain. It is, ironically, one of the cooler areas. Some things of note. Grab the fucking elite bow behind these rocks, use the crushed palmyra on them. Upgrade it, and it'll make your life in the final bosses easier. Another thing is that this area is the only one where moveset Palmyra is absolutely necessary. Can't touch lava because that shit is fucking lava. You gotta use your flow Palmyra to get over the lava and get this area's flavor of key item. Half a pair of balls. Sure, you do use float in other sections of the game, like in the underground research lab. There's these pools of poison because fuck you, it's a FromSoft game. Of course there's poison shit, and you were recommended to float over it. It's not required? You could just as easily power through, healing whenever you're low. But float is absolutely necessary in the abandoned road, and it's the only time like that in the game. It'd be cool to see other movement-based Palmyra and see the other existing one actually get used. You can get these speed boots that make you run fast. Would've been a fun little set piece to have you use that as the floor falls behind you. Or maybe have something like a jump Palmyra. 
I'm not suggesting making Evergrace a platformer. More like how Lost Kingdoms 2 did its jump, where there's a few areas where it's needed and it could be used to avoid damage and dodge attacks. Would have been a fun way to change up some pacing and have the player interact with the Palmyra mechanics more. The boss fight at the end has a pretty sick design. Dude's a big warrior man power walking and leaping at you. You could have an honest fight, but between his fast leaps and the camera fighting you, not allowing to look behind you when you're running away, just lame it out. Either equip the bow or arrange Palmyra, running from one end of the room to the other. Wow, this game sure loves teleporting Charlene. So each character's story isn't long, around three to four hours per campaign. Don't believe me? We're already in the final set of areas. The Soaring Tower. Shit's super fucking quick. It was at this section of the game where a piece of my equipment actually broke for the first time. Your equipment, your armor and weapons and even accessories, all have durability which you can easily check and see where it's at because that's what the bars at the bottom right represent. The durability of a piece of equipment drains when it's in use. For example, if you get hit, your armor will take some damage. Use your weapon, it gets damaged. Walk and your legs get damaged. Palmyra absolutely drains your durability. That's actually how my chest piece broke. Decided to use the Fire Palmyra on the area's boss and ran out of durability. There's two ways that this can be fixed. Either go to the shop and exchange money to repair it or use an item to do so if you can't get to the shop. There's one type of equipment that you should never repair. Sounds counterintuitive, I know. But this game is jank and that jank can be exploited. There's no reason to ever repair your heroic necklace ever. When it heals you, it drains its durability until it breaks. Makes sense. What doesn't make sense is that it still heals you even after it breaks. Fine by me, I'm not gonna complain. Fight the big ice thing, get a teleporter once again, and you'll find Morpheus, Trandon, and Sienna locked only to be blue balled with no boss fight and a cliffhanger. Thus ends Charlene's half, and so begins Darius's. Back in Saramad Hill, this time with Darius. Ah, fresh air. How I've missed the outside environment. Saramad Hill, much like with Charlene, serves as a tutorial area for Darius as well as giving his story a setup as well as giving Darius motivation. Darius gets isekai here and meets Chrysalis, a demon bird lady thing who's helping Darius. And talking to the locals helps us learn that Darius got that curse crash shit going on and people really hate it. Get away! Ah! The cursed Like, really hate it. Luckily, there's just the sword right where Darius wakes up. Pretty decent starting weapon, way better than a frying pan. After helping out some guy being attacked, he too discriminates against the crest and fucks over Darius, whose only choice now is to go into the spooky cave. Darius and Charlene play the same in that they have two attacks per weapon and that most enemies are just gonna walk around and poke their asshole. Yeah, you should be pretty decent at the anal game by this point, that's not to say that Darius is gonna feel the exact same, just mostly the same. But he does differ with the weapons he can receive as well as animations with common weapons. To start, he does not receive the spear or the bow. Whereas Charlene focused on zoning out the common mook, Darius receives primarily close range weapons like the sword from the beginning or hammers that require baiting out attacks. He's also a much more capable fighter. Charlene looks like she's flailing around with the club at best while Darius can swing it with some ease. These differences in animation of course affect their playstyle but also helps to characterize them. Darius is a soldier. The dude trains. Of course he'd be more capable than Charlene and it's nice to see that reflected here. The Royal Passage wouldn't be that notable of an area if it weren't for the traps in this location. There's three in particular. The first is this little demon fellow who latches onto you if you open up its chest and just poisons you. You can get rid of it by hitting up the shop. When you activate a switch, if you don't immediately move, you'll be shot by a wall of arrows, throwing you to your death. It's got a good laugh out of me. I can respect the casual fuck you to the player with that move. And the last one before fighting this area's boss are the spears in the ground. Just power through it. Fun area. I like it. Now outside Rubane Castle, the enemies here are fucking weird. They look weird, they move weird, and I like the design of the enemies in this game. It really helps add to that far off, otherworldly feel this game has going for it. Inside the castle now, and the weirdness don't stop. There's this courtyard area that feels off-putting. It's a castle courtyard, and yet it's dark and closed off with a ceiling. It's really fucking strange. <laughs> The boss in this area does have an interesting design, but coming out of the castle and into the congregation chamber, and we're met with a fucking rad demon. Motherfucker looking like Satan. That shit is rad. From the chamber, we go deeper into the underground shrine. This area is a series of hallways and locked doors revolving around this area's puzzle. Their grace has like three different types of puzzles. The shrine has a unique one involving these colored mirrors. When you rotate them, they combine to create colors, and the door of that corresponding color will unlock and open. 
I highly recommend going through the blue door for the heroic necklace and through the green door for the Zul's toy. Grab and upgrade that shit to max because that makes every encounter from here on bitch easy. Outside of that, there's the puzzle that require finding a key item such as the balls you need for outside the castle or abandoned road. And there's also the puzzles that require specific equipment. In the shrine and also in the human research lab with Charlene, in order to progress you needed equipment that contained specific Palmyra. This ice room required you to use fire, which required you to get the fire armor. I don't know how to feel about this. And there's statues of armor sets asking you to go back to the shop and color your armor set into a specific color, like blue. The equipment based puzzles are really easy, basically no challenge whatsoever. I feel they're only there to give the player something to do with the money they've collected or to get into fights if they don't have the cash on hand, requiring the player to interact with the game rather than just running past every enemy there is. Grab your boots, open up the blue white door? I mean cyan? Uh huh? Back outside in the royal commons. You gotta run around and find some hat to complete your royal getup and it turns out this old dying guy was the king. King of shit, fuck him, steal from the old and get teleported through the ice caverns. These next areas really help capture why I feel that Darius has the better of the two campaigns in Evergrace, and that's because of the areas themselves. Go through the ice caverns, and you come out into the Colosseum, the sick venue to have a boss fight in. After the fight, you fall into the abandoned road. Darius not only has such a better variety of areas, but has far more areas unique to him. Throughout Darius's story, you've been alternating between areas with sky or ceiling above your head. And that matters more than you think. Charlene, in contrast, after the opening bit in the Royal Commons, finds herself in the Human Research Lab, Abandoned Road, and the Soaring Tower. With the exception of the Abandoned Road, because that place is visually different relying on a lot of reds, all her other areas look like hallways. There isn't a whole lot of openness in her areas, and that creates a samey feeling throughout. Darius is constantly flipping through areas outside and in. Whereas Charlene's only area unique to her is the Human Research Lab, Darius gets the Royal Passage, the entire castle section, Congregation Chamber, Shrine, and now the Ice Caverns and Colosseum. He's given way more variety in terms of locale. Every time you enter a new location, it feels fresh and new, and that really helps with the pacing. It feels like you're moving and getting shit the fuck done and fucking some shit up. The Colosseum is some sick build up to having you fight this motherfucker. Look at him, this muscly demonic looking fucker ready to throw down. Wow, he went down like a punk bitch. And now I'm going down like a punk bitch too and finding myself in the abandoned roads. Yeah, bosses can be quite the pushover. On my first playthrough, some of them gave me far more trouble than this time around. The Sienna fight and the warrior in the abandoned road with Charlene gave me some serious trouble then. But on the second time around, I learned that every single boss has a method to kill them the fuck dead. With the Darius, as soon as you get the Zul's toy and upgrade it, the game is solved. Almost solved. Melee don't work on the boss in the abandoned road here, so you gotta rely on range. And, uh, this dude is fucking pathetic. He's slow as shit, got shit range, and dumb as shit on top of that. Bait him into an attack, run up a little bit, throw some ice cubes or some shit at him, and back off. Rinse and repeat. An actual joke of a fight. And the final area for Darius is the same as Charlene, the Soaring Tower. Fuck the Soaring Tower. It ends on this gauntlet of enemies you have to fight, but it, the enemies take so long to spawn in. It's some bullshit. And unlike Charlene, once you reach Morpheus, you actually get to fight him. Maybe. So apparently there's a bug that might happen where Morpheus can be impossible to beat, in which case just reset your console and it should be fixed. But his elderly, fragile, brittle bones snap when I whack him with my hammer. And with that, you're at the final bosses. Each character gets one. I fought Chrysalis with Darius and Haircut with Charlene. These were fucking bitches to fight on my first playthrough, but knowing now which equipment to upgrade and bring in made these super short and standard. And that's Evergrace. Don't ask me what actually happened story-wise because I barely understand. I mean, the actual character motivations are easy to understand. I wanna go home, and I wanna go home. Oh shit, there's Charlene, are simple motivations that I got. But there's a ton of background that just flew over my head. There's some information in the loading screens you could read if the game didn't load before you can finish reading them. And there's just a ton of jargon that is mentioned but never explained like what the fuck a cycle is. Not a whole lot gets explained in this game, but it apparently gets fleshed out in the novelization. So yeah, Evergrace actually has a fucking novelization. I also learned that it also has a fan translation. Hell yeah! Except fuck me, I shouldn't be getting too excited because the fan translation is... Uh... 
but with the power of luck, Darius pushes the sword in deeper and finishes the monster off. Charlene staggers backwards, shrieking some noise that could never come from a human. You know, I don't actually get the intricacies of this bit here, and I'm here to write about Darius and Charlene being best friends, not to see them beat each other to death, so I'm freeballing it. Contact me if this pisses you off somehow. It's not the best. I haven't read all of it, but you can at least get the story from it in between the translator's additional commentary and I don't want to translate this. I would love to see a full, proper translation of this one day, but it would lose some charm. It's very clear that this translator loves Evergrace to the point that they even added their own illustrations throughout. Like, a bunch of them, too. They're really cute and adorable. As I've said, I haven't really read a whole lot of it, but this novelization drastically differs from the game story to the point of even containing characters from the prequel and this video's second subject of discussion, Forever Kingdom. They did it again. Those bastards somehow, yet again, made another one of my favorite title screens and themes. How do they do it? Forever Kingdom, believe it or not, is a prequel to Evergrace. See, Darius is right there. But for some reason, the name got changed from Evergrace 2, which is what it's called in Japan, to Forever Kingdom. But when it comes to when Forever Kingdom takes place, there is a real basic timeline. Charlene Isekai, Forever Kingdom, Darius Isekai. Got it? Good. The game opens with a cutscene introducing us to the protagonist. Darius, I've already mentioned, is back, and he's tagging alongside Ryan and Feyana. Ryan is a friend of Darius, and they're both looking to join up in the Sultan War effort, and along the way they picked up and looked after Feyana, who happens to have amnesia, not knowing anything prior to a year earlier. The trio run into some creep and his bodyguard, Darcel and Drumhort respectively, harassing some girl. The three, having some morals, run up and try to protect the girl until they get cursed into a soul bind. Well, ain't that some shit, but the girl did manage to run off. So what is a soul bind? A soul bind is some forbidden shit that links together souls. Basically, if one person gets hurt, they all do, and if one person dies, then the rest follows. They don't really get into much more detail than that, but it really does make me wonder if pain is the only thing shared. Like, if one of them jerks off what the other two know? Look, shit's stressful, they're running around and fucking shit up and getting their shit fucked up. If they want to release some stress, release some seed, go for a quickie, would the other two also start coming? If you sucked off someone you were soul binded with, would it be like you were sucking yourself off? Soul bind sucks. That's some bad shit and they can't be having it. They gotta find that cum bag, fuck them up and get decursed. But there's also some shit about that one girl being harassed too. Apparently Feyana feels some mystery connection with the mystery girl. How mysterious. The story isn't any better or worse than what Evergrace has going for it, but the way the story is presented and delivered is way better in Forever Kingdom than its predecessor. For one thing, the game has real ass cutscenes, and a decent amount of them too. Evergrace would have a couple cutscenes here and there, but they would mostly be, oh shit, here's this big bad boss man, now fuck him up, and not much would be said in them other than that. Because Forever Kingdom follows a trio, there's way more discussions within the cutscenes. The main characters talk to each other, and you get a feel for their personalities, what they're feeling, and probably the best aspect of this, they'll actually explain shit. A really good example of this is a cutscene at the beginning where the trio finds a child's drawing. In Evergrace, you'd probably be prompted with a text box describing it, and then move on. But here you get a cutscene. In it, the three look at it and have a bit of banter between them. You learn that Ryan is a bit playful, teasing Feyana, and that it's been a while since Darius has laughed. He a angry boy, looking real piss on that box art. That then transitions into describing Darius' goal and motivations, seeking revenge on Moria. It's really nice to finally get some narrative in this duology. That's far from the only change here. First off, it's linear. No balance between campaigns, which I'm fine with. But way more apparent is you're controlling the party of three throughout the whole game. You're only controlling one at a time, but you're free to swap who you're playing as with just the press of a button. There wouldn't really be any need to do so if there weren't differences in the three characters, and those differences incentivize the player to, at least occasionally, switch the character they're controlling. Each player character has a unique property to them. Darius can start Palmyra chains, more on that later. Ryan can just defend for health back, and Feyana builds Palmyra meter for all three rather than just herself. Again, more on that later. Not only that, some equipment can't be equipped by some characters. Darius can't do ice equipment or spears while Ryan can, for example. While you aren't controlling the other two characters, they aren't doing nothing. They are still somewhat active. They'll occasionally attack at other enemies, and when attacked, they're surprisingly really good at guarding on their own. You do manually control their Palmyra ability by pressing the corresponding face button, and all three characters share the same health pool. This ties back into the story, they are soul-binded after all, which I really like narratively. 
and it's not at all annoying as it may sound either. As I said, the other two members are really good at guarding, and they usually only ever get hit if you fuck up and use their Palmyra ability at the wrong time, which can result in a long recovery window. It still feels like all mistakes and deaths are your fault. Basic attacking is the same, you got your neutrals and tilts, but the Palmyra system is completely reworked. Rather than being determined by the character's gear, there's a dedicated Palmyra accessory slot to freely swap out, mix, and match to your liking. Darius's default is so fucking good, it's just a solid, really fast DP. Your Palmyra attacks can also be chained together, which the game luckily starts off by giving a tutorial on how it works or what it even is. If this wasn't here, I would have never known it to be a thing that exists straight up. While playing as Darius because he's the only one who can start this, if you use his Palmyra ability to follow up with the other two, you'll get items when you kill enemies. Pretty cool. Also not necessary and I rarely ever did it in standard play. Palmyra is also limited by the meter you gain from attacking and getting attacked. Darius and Orion build meter exclusively for themselves, but if playing as Feana, she'll build meter for the whole party. That also means that Palmyra is no longer limited to the durability of equipment. Hell yeah. But that's also because durability is gone. Hell yeah! Why the fuck is he so big now? That's legitimately terrifying. Durability isn't the only thing left on the cutting room floor. Same goes for armor coloring and accessories. Good, get that shit out of here. You may think, what the fuck am I gonna do now without the heroic necklace? That shit was great. And it was great. But Forever Kingdom just has weapons and armor that just regens health now. And, even better, you could just throw the passive regen shit on the other party members and, even if you aren't playing as them, still reap the regen benefit, which is sick. That's not the only property that weapons can have. My favorite property is the drain. I fucking love sapping health and claiming it as my own. It creates a more aggressive and active playstyle as it incentivizes getting in there and fucking shit up, rather than playing defensively or using items. Other properties include guard breaks which axes tend to have, and critical hits which spears tend to have. There's a weapon you can buy fairly early on which is a weird stretchy sword thing that the characters look like they can barely hold on to. Fucking love this thing. It's got good fucking range and it drains as well. Later on you get a big fuck off sword that's just a straight upgrade in every way and I fell in love with that thing and used it the entire rest of the game. Good fucking poke drain and it's fucking massive. I can hit everything. As you get further into the game your elemental resistances on your armor start to matter more and more. There's a boss in the latter half where if you walk in unprepared you'll get shot down with some ice shit and just oh fuck. That's a shit ton of health. Uh fuck. I'm dead. But if you walk in with the ice gear, then you can actually take a couple hits more than not at all. That kind of lends to the fact that bosses are generally tougher than the bosses are in Evergrace. As I already mentioned, some of them really make sure you're walking in with the right gear or get fucked. But enemies are also generally more aggressive as well. But what makes the bosses specifically more challenging is their ability to overwhelm you. The boss I've been mentioning, the one between the younger princess, is in this room that gradually fills up more and more with ads. Now, those ads aren't actually all that bad. They're mostly just there for visual distraction, but that bitch ain't no slouch either, constantly pelting you with hard hitting ice balls. But if you want some absolute fuckery and bullshit when it comes to overwhelming, the second to last boss can go fuck off. There's a floating fucker that shoots lasers at you from off fucking screen, good luck seeing that shit. Try to kill it, fuck you, respawn that shit. That motherfucker Darcel keeps throwing these fucking rings on the ground that hurts you if you touch the edges if you aren't guarding. But way worse is that it inflicts all fucking status effects at once. But the cherry on this shit sandwich, that bastard drum hoard, that piece of shit is chasing you, dealing massive damage if he catches you sleeping. But oh and get this, he has an instant kill attack. Go fuck yourself game. And if you manage to get past this and die in the last boss, you'll have to redo this fight, because fuck you, that's why. Oh, but my favorite part is that you're basically forced to the walls because of that flying shit in the middle. And the camera fucking hates the walls, and especially hates you. Good luck seeing, asshole. Forever Kingdom is way more hostile to the player than Evergrace ever was. Evergrace had its moments, especially in the Royal Passage with its traps, but it was never on Forever Kingdom's level. The chests are terrifying to open. Now, of course, you'll open them and get shit like items or money, but you can also open them to find nothing? Why the fuck give me a chest? What's the point? Occasionally, you'll open one up and find a thing that pops out and just explodes all up in your face. These aren't that bad to deal with. I got into the habit of just guarding every time I opened up a chest, and that issue is solved. 
But the actual thing that brings up the anxiety is sometimes these little fuckers will pop out of the chests. Quick, there's a brief window to fucking swing first. If you do, crisis averted. If you take too long or clink off the wall because the chest is too close to a wall, that fuck will grab onto you. This little shit will fucking sap you of all your health, requiring you to heal if you don't have any regen yet. And it clings to you for such a long ass time. During that duration, guess the fuck what? Can't attack, can't use Palmyra, can't use other characters' Palmyra to get it off. You just gotta sit there, spread those chase and get rammed in the asshole, and you just gotta take it. As if shit couldn't get worse, it poisons you before leaving. And rarely, only happened to me once in my entire playthrough, fucking two can latch onto you as if the game itself is telling me personally, fuck you. And there are areas where you can just feel the game's sadism from the gimmicks of those areas. There's two in particular that stand out, the Dark Caverns and the Land of the Dead. In the Dark Caverns, there's a couple of intersections that every time you pass them, these leech things will just rain on the characters' heads. They will drain your health and also inflict the curse status effect. But it's at least not as bad as the chest fuckers as you can just use your Palmyra abilities to get them off of you. A couple areas later, you'll find yourself in the Land of the Dead. This area's gimmick, every enemy has an instant kill attack. Get fucked. I get that this area is called the Land of the Dead, but I thought that was because the inhabitants were dead, but it's apparently because the game wants me dead. Speaking of areas, there's a ton of variety here when it comes to the locales you find yourself in. A lot of unique aesthetics, color palettes, and styles to make each area memorable and feel different from one another. And this helps the pacing of the game as well. Every half hour period or so, you'll find yourself in a totally new location. New feel, new gimmick as well. This keeps the game feeling fresh throughout as it feels like you're not doing the exact same thing each and every area. And yeah, areas tend to have gimmicks that last an area and by the time the gimmick feels played out, you're already somewhere new. I've already discussed Land of the Dead's gimmick, that being instant kills. Another cool area gimmick is the Endless Waterfall. This entire area requires you to fall down onto various levels of elevation and to fall in the correct path to find the area's key item of escape. Every time you go down the wrong way and hit the bottom, you can teleport back up to the top to then try again. It's a neat idea that is unique to only that area and it isn't a terribly long area either. There's a lot, like a lot, that makes Forever Kingdom way different to Evergrace to the point that I'm actually surprised that it is Evergrace 2. FromSoft did have a history of making similar games that have some differences where they were like, this is basically Kingsfield, but let's call it Shadow Tower instead. But then you got Forever Kingdom, which is so different in gameplay and structure. But because Darius is here, slap on that Evergrace name. That's not to say that there isn't a lot that similar. Art direction is similar. Kota Hoshino back on the track. If you want to know how I feel about the music in this game, just go back to Evergrace's music section and slap on a Forever Kingdom coat of paint on it. I think I love just about every track on this OST, and that is in part to Kota Hoshino definitely leaning way more into the fucking weird. If Evergrace was Kota Hoshino getting used to this style of music, Forever Kingdom is where he's found his footing and is comfortable just having fun and fucking around with the soundtrack. It was a delight progressing further through the game because it usually meant a new song. Even if you never end up playing the game, go listen to the game's soundtrack. There's not much else like it. There's a certain ineffable quality and charm to the Forever Grace games. They're, they're fucking jank, they're unapologetic, they're strange, Forever Kingdom has ass final bosses, and I can't help but love them. And despite the frustration that those final bosses caused, I gotta say I ended up liking Forever Kingdom more. That extra year it had on Evergrace for sure helped as FromSoft got a bit more familiar with the new hardware they were working with, which led to a game with a better feel than its predecessor. I believe the systems at play, the music playing throughout, and an actually cohesive narrative make it a much more solid package. But Evergrace 2 I thoroughly enjoy as much as its sequel, Evergrace 2. Evergrace feels like the peak and pinnacle of a PS2-ass PS2 game. When I envision what it means to be a PS2 game, Evergrace comes into mind and defines this generation. Sure, there's a bunch of way more polished and amazing games that came out this generation, but Forevergrace really captures the spirit of this era of games, for its better and its worse.